And here I got a comment from Matt Jones, and he says, this is for anyone to answer. Opinions? I am pretty new to this information, and I understand now that there was an event in the not too distant past. What I don't understand is what happened after the event. How did the earth repopulate, etc. Were certain groups of people protected or spared? Did some groups of people just happen to live in areas that were not destroyed? What about the animals? Who was responsible for the destruction? And how did the new rulers take over after the event? Thanks for any thoughts. And I am totally confused. And thank you, Matt, for the comment. And I don't think you're totally confused. I think that you know more than most. And this research is fairly new. Any of us have the same thoughts who have been doing this kind of research. And let me try to answer some of these questions. What I don't understand is what happened after the event. Now, of course, I don't know. But we do see a sudden emergence of people. And a lot of these people at World's Fairs dressed very well and seeming very dumb. And really the whole idea of the World's Fairs is pretty ridiculous. There's no way people are traveling in the late 1800s across the world just for some stupid fare. You have to take a boat, you have to use a horse and buggy to travel across the land, which could take weeks or months. And really, from the pictures we see, these fairs didn't even look that interesting. But we do have clues. There is almost no children at these fairs, all adults. And then what else we see is baby incubators being displayed and giving away, in some cases raffling away, babies. And what a strange display to see at a fair. A display of babies without their parents around and oftentimes selling and raffling them off. Very strange, so this lends to the question of what happened after the event. Now I showed a video, I think I called it the Reset Passport, and we look at a passport that was issued at a World's Fair and it looks more like a driver's license or a passport rather than a World's Fair. And I had hypothesized that perhaps these people were coming out of these buildings. Perhaps they were not going to the World's Fair. Perhaps they were leaving the World's Fair, as these were grand and glorious buildings beyond the abilities of construction in that time, beyond the needs of the fair goers. And what it really seemed like is these people were coming from these buildings, perhaps underground, and unclear as to why the thousands upon thousands of orphanages, and again tied in with these baby incubators, and the shipping of orphans from country to country, really making no sense all through the historical narrative, shipping orphans all over the place. And we really do see a repopulating, an effort to repopulate these fully built out cities found all throughout this realm. And of course, the inheriting of all of these buildings. Clearly there were adults 
clearly there were people who were spared from this event, either by accident, but more likely by design, as they seem to have a plan. The first wave of controllers, and perhaps not the controllers, just acting as the hands of the real controllers. Perhaps those who spared the lives of these controllers. And I always reference the Native American Hopi and their reset story that they were brought underground by the ant people in the last cataclysm and they survived this cataclysm and were saved by a people or maybe not a human people called the ant people seeming very alien like to me but nonetheless a clue again couple this with all the underground passageways found everywhere with no exception. Whole cities under the earth and tunnels and passageways connecting them. So clearly somebody is in the know, some people are spared, and there seems to be a repopulating. And another question? Did some groups of people just happen to live in areas that were not destroyed? This must absolutely be true, and certainly there are regions in our realm in which we are not even allowed to explore as free human citizens on this plane. One being Antarctica, and we are not allowed to visit this region, and perhaps this is a safe haven in times of reset. The mass itself sits high above sea level and also regions in the north. We really have little say and we are very helpless. For many of us it would be very difficult to even go to Greenland as I would like to. But yes, there are probably areas that were not destroyed, and we even see that in the areas that we live. Kind of hit and miss. And what about the animals? Surely they would have had to have been repopulated as well. Not very likely that they would stay put through all of this and fare any better than the humans. And of course, going back to the Bible story, this is a good time to bring up Noah's Ark and the idea that someone was looking after the animals. Being a story and seeming like a primitive story to us, but actually being very, very high tech and probably way beyond our understanding. And in a very similar fashion, if one back in the days could save all the animals, surely somebody was looking out for us too and put us away either in a DNA form or an actual form, safe from harm through this cataclysm. And the last question is who is responsible for the destruction? And how did the new rulers take over after the event? Not sure if any party was responsible for this destruction, or if it's a natural cycle. And as far as how did the rulers take over? Probably pretty easy. When you're the top dog after such an event, you know more than the rest, and pretty easy to create a new system that others will follow 
educating children, essentially, on a false history. And the rest is history. And here somebody shared this link with me on this channel. And it discusses the work of this Dr. Kevin Anderson. And this ties in with what I was discussing in my last video. We were looking at rock formations. And questioning whether these rock formations were ancient plant life, trees, buildings, or giant creatures. And I've often heard from Roger at Mud Fossil University that portions of these seemingly chunks of stone and rock have been tested. And when tested, under microscopes, they turn up having the cellular structure of creatures, biological life forms. And I always thought this was fascinating, but had never really seen the research and science behind it. And here in Wyoming, this was just a experiment, and these researchers dug no more than a foot or two, and uncovered this prehistoric horn. And they especially went to this area because it was known to have remains of dinosaurs, which they're telling us are millions of years old. And here, just a couple feet under the ground, in a climate that reaches extreme heats, and cold, a lot of moisture, and this horn, in pretty good shape, was brought back to their lab for further testing. And it really appeared to be petrified and have a stone composition. And they end up breaking bits off and soaking them in an acid, which I believe removed the calcium, revealing the cellular structure. And here we can see the fibers. Again, all the calcium has been dissolved away, revealing this fibrous biological structure. And the longer it soaked in this acid, it actually became somewhat rubbery and flexible, as would be expected with tissues. And here again, getting an idea of these tissues. And I would love to follow up with Roger's findings. Again, analyzing common rocks. And here we can see an article, a published paper, discussing these soft sheets of fiber bone from a fossil of the horn of the dinosaur, Triceratops horridus. And it leads me to conclude that we're really seeing a combination of different things throughout this realm resembling mountains. And we are often awestricken with the beauty and also puzzled at how such things could be created, especially when we're left with our indoctrination and false education and try to fit all understanding for these wonders into the small box we've been given. But again, looking at it from a greater perspective, outside of the box, we can conceive that we are dealing with ancient trees of unimaginable sizes, remains of buildings, and also the remains of giant and not so giant creatures alike. And if the smallest thing could petrify, then no doubt the largest of things could too. And what can be said about finding such petrified body parts only about a foot under the earth, a fairly young 
and more recent layer of earth according to the sciences how could a soft tissue maintain its composition for millions of years still be recognizable as tissue and biological material but again something to follow up on very interesting and very important and I think that will be the next step to this research and understanding our past if it is possible to soak rock or seeming rock in these acids and view them under a microscope we can begin testing everything seen in this realm and it's becoming more and more clear that our surroundings are not what they seem and here without any great importance or urgency I thought I would share with you a little mud flood this was featured on ABC News and I'm not even sure if I can show it but I'm gonna try and here we just see a seemingly solid chunk of land a part of the coastline just sloughing off into the sea with all the houses no longer having any value and very interesting how unpermanent things can become in just a moment and really oftentimes seeming as if this mass of land on which we dwell is just floating on top of the water and constantly reshaping itself and in large reset events I'm sure that this is commonplace all throughout our realm and not just localized as we see here but very interesting and finally I just wanted to show this little free energy clip and this guy wraps a copper wire around a magnet and I've seen many of these experiments where there's just very few moving parts and these are ways of generating free energy and here again just a couple magnets on some other larger magnets wrapped with copper wire and producing a current again all we're looking for is a current if we can create this on a small level then we can create it on a large level and just seeming to be what we see found all throughout these older buildings and the tech usually on the rooftops and this picture is brought to us by Jerry at When the Buildings Cried, formerly Subphotonic. So I guess that's it for today. I thank you for joining me. Do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.